Hi, this is Nicole Miller, and you're watching YA Wise, a hub for parents and readers. <laughs> okay, so our first book up is Princess Academy by Shannon Hale. So this is one of my all-time favorite books. I've read it for the first time in like third grade, and it's one of the first books that I remember um, stopping and really enjoying, like the art of the storytelling in it. Um, it's super awesome. As you can tell, it's won the Newbery. I'll get into some of the other awards that it's won. Um, it's by Shannon Hale. It was published in 2005 by Bloomsbury Press. Um, it's super awesome. I love it so much. As I was reading and like preparing to do this, uh, a lot of people either hearing about the idea or seeing with the book were super excited. They were like, oh, I love Princess Academy. Such a good book. Would definitely like recommend this to everyone. <laughs> um, so it follows Miri, a young girl from the village of Mount Eskel in Danland and several other girls from her village, she and several other girls from her village are selected, um, kidnapped, <laughs> and taken to an academy to tra be trained in their own national customs and also just like general education things um, in preparation to meet the Prince of Danland and potentially become his wife. So, kind of classic princess training in that way. It does divert a little bit from the trope, which I'll get into. So, Shannon Hale, author of this book, one of my favorite authors of all time. She has written just in like everything. She has adult novels, she's got some more like older YA. This falls into more of a middle grade category. Like I said, I read it for the first time in like third grade. I think it's recommended for a little bit of an older age than that. Um, yeah, it's recommended like fourth through eighth grade, but just good stuff um but yeah she has some graphic novels as well she's super cool Shannon Hale awesome uh <laughs> yes so this is the third book she ever published uh the other two being part of her is first one I think is Goose Girl and then there's a follow-up to that one um she lives with her husband and her four kids in Utah yes you, uh, Goose Girl was her first book published in 2003 and also kind of as a fantasy fairy tale feeling to it, much like Princess Academy. Um, now, besides writing, she's, uh, like I said, she's writing all the time and all sorts of things. Um, she travels and she talks advocating for gender equality. She's got some really cool articles out there that you can find sort of talking about why, you know, why do we limit what people read and advocating like, let people read what they wanna read. Um, sort of all over so super cool you should look into that for sure so princess academy's won a lot of awards most notably notably that newberry of honor that i mentioned it's a new york times bestseller publisher's weekly bestseller it's a book sense pick um the ala notable children's award beehive award utah book children utah children's book award uh new york library book for teen selection uh, it's a Bank Street College Children's Best Book of the Year, a YLSA popular paperback for young adults, and it's on seven different states, like, award lists for 2005 when it was published for, like, Great Book Street. So this is one that is very highly regarded, um, very much one that I would recommend. Um, some of the other ones we'll discuss are more like, it's not great writing but it's fun to read it's a good time right and so but this is both good time and excellent writing um, and well noted so it has a, a 0.6 or a 6.0 on the AR score um, but is recommended for like four through eight in uh, sort of content level I have another video up that explains all of those what do those mean? Um, the AR score and then also the Lexile score, which is, um, it has an 890 Lexile score. So there are some more frightening, intense scenes. Um, there's a lot of kind of bigotry that gets brought up. It's definitely shown in a negative light as like a bad thing and it is proven false, um, but it does occur and these students go through some pretty hard things. Um, and so, things to keep in mind um, with as you're highlighting this book to your kids or if your kids are reading this that you want to be aware of that those things are coming up so it has a 4.5 stars out of 
1,200 reviews on Amazon and 4.3 stars out of 113,000 reviews on Goodreads. Um, so again, well-respected, well-liked book out there. Okay, I'm gonna give you a brief summary of, the, of Princess Academy, just so you kind of have an idea of what is going on in this book. So our main character is Miri. Uh, Miri is a young girl. She lives on Mount Eskel, which is a mountain village um, in the country of Danland. Um, Mount Eskel is not fully like a province of Danland. It's like an extra territory. But, so, but they, they live in this mountain and they quarry a stone called Linder. Um, and this is all that this little village does. They're a very tight-knit community, but every year they struggle to quarry enough Linder to sell to traders so that they can get um, enough to feed their families uh, each season. So the book starts at the just before the last trading before winter because once winter happens uh, the, the the traders can't make it up the mountain so it's a little bit high pressure they have to trade enough to uh, feed their families for the winter um, so Miri is responsible for doing the trading for her family which is her and her older sister and her father um, and her sister and her father work in the quarry but Miri does not um, so with, but when the traders arrive so does a official person from the government shows up and says uh, the priests have said that the next princess of Danland is here in this province or in this territory so you're all hillbilly mountain people and we can't have a princess who's a hillbilly mountain person so we're gonna set up an official academy and all of the eligible young women are required to attend and so yeah, we'll be back to collect your girls later, and then he leaves, and they're all kind of like, what? Um, <laughs> so that happens, and then, so the girls eventually do go, there's some pushback of like, you can't just take our children. Uh, but Mira goes, uh, her sister's not, her sister's too old uh, to marry the prince. She's like a couple months older than him or something. So they go to school, uh, they meet their new tutor, Miss Olana. Alana is not very nice to them. She's very strict. She's um, somewhat upset. She had previously been teaching in like a prestigious kind of school setting and then was chosen for this assignment. And she was like, I, she couldn't turn down the king and queen, but like she did not want to come out and teach these hillbilly girls because that is sort of the general perception of these mountain people that they're just, they're not well educated. At one point, someone makes the comment of like, you know, that they're probably right that this mountain air is bad for your brains. Um, so the lowlanders are very much looked look down on the mountain people, but then also the residents of Mount Eskel kind of look down on them of like, well, you're just snobby and rude. Um, <laughs> and you're just all full of yourselves and terrible people. So there's kind of an exchange of stereotypes there. So the schools start their schooling, the girls start their schooling. Um, Olana dishes out lots of harsh punishments. Um, she makes the girls sit in a closet, just like a dark closet sometimes, and there are rats there. Um, and so it's not ideal. Uh, she's, it's definitely shown as like that is a negative thing as she's pushing them of, they don't even know how to read most of them when they arrive. And so she's trying to get them into shape within a year so they can marry the prince. So she denies letting them go home the first weekend that they're there and then after that it becomes winter and then it's too cold and too snowy to make it back up so they have to stay at the school for the entire winter and some of the girls blame Miri for this because uh, this is given as a punishment when she tries to help a younger student uh, with her lessons um, because that girl was sent to the closet and missed a lesson and so she was trying to help her catch up and Olana did not. It's like, there's no talking during my lesson. Who do you think you are? Getting up and doing other things that she was like, I'm just helping her. But uh, so the other girls are somewhat mad at her. But over the winter, they make a lot of progress. They learn how to read. Um, they start learning Danland's customs. Um, 
they learn some about trading etiquette, poise, other such topics. Um, Miri starts to befriend a girl, Britta, and Britta is actually a lowlander. She had shown up a couple months prior and her aunt and said, my parents have died. My closest living relatives are here in Mount Eskel. And so she's not really a part of their community. A lot of the girls kind of look down on her because of that perception that, well, you're a lowlander, you're you just think that we're all bad. Um, but Miri befriends her and learns that kind of both of their ideas and conceptions of each other are misguided. Um, and Miri just becomes de dedicated to being the Academy Princess, so like, which is like the valedictorian. So she wants to do the best at anyone at the Academy. And if they do, then she gets a fancy silver dress <laughs> as what's given, to, shown to be the reward, uh, which these girls have not had a lot of like elegance and beauty because they're in a more rural village societies where they've lived their whole lives. Um, so in the spring, the girls get to go home. They actually defy Olana. She tells them, don't, no, you haven't earned it. And they just leave. They said, no, we're going home. Uh, and they get to celebrate spring festival with their families. Um, and after that, they kind of weigh their options if they want to go back. Um, and they decide to, they go back, they use some of their newfound skills in uh, negotiation to say, uh, we will come and we will be good students, but you are not allowed to hit us or put us in a closet anymore or deny us visits home. Um, and they're able to work out a better situation for both of both parties. Um, and Alana is then treats them much better i think seeing that like they are learning she is able to ease up a little more um then miri is doing some extra reading on commerce and trading just in her search for knowledge and she discovers that linder this stone that they quarry that is their only export is actually a very valuable material that like this is the primary stone used to build palaces and Mount Eskel is the only place that it is quarried. Um, and she realizes, oh, these traders have been ripping us off forever. Um, and that my, I could buy, barely, you know, get enough, buy enough to feed my family through the whole summer or for the whole winter with what we'd quarried. But really like one block should have probably been enough for that. Um, and so she goes home and works with the adults of her village and they the next time the traders come they say you are going to pay us a fair price for what we've quarried um which then completely kind of revolutionizes life because now they're able to afford more than just the bare necessities um it also opens some doors later on where mary has this friend peter who they kind of cute little romance going on in there it's kind of on the side um he's not around much because the academy is just girls so he was not invited <laughs> but he's interested in like art and carving and so his family is able to say okay well what if you carve some we can set aside some time for you to carve linder because we don't need all of your time and effort just to try and earn you know a living for our family so that ends up being a very beneficial thing for them that mary discovers this in this book and is then able to advocate for their rights there. Um, also, Miri, the next time she goes home, after that point, she her sister is injured in a quarry accident, um, and she goes rushing into the quarry to check on her, and her father kind of blows up at her and explodes and says, get out, you're not supposed to be in the quarry. He's told, her whole life told her not to be. Um, and that's when she learns that her mother actually died of a result as a, of a quarry accident. Um, and that her father is concerned about the same thing happening. And also, in, when she learns this, it, she learns it from another mom in the village who is able to, she, her fears that she's looked down upon because she's not, she doesn't work in the quarry like everyone else are put aside. They're like, she's like, no one, the mother gets to be like, no one thinks that of you. Like, you know, there are other people here that don't and also have just absolutely valid reasons we all see and understand why your father would not want you in this quarry because her mom was pregnant during this accident and gave birth shortly after and then died. 
Um, and so then Mary is able to be more confident in herself. She's not so self-conscious about this. Oh, I'm just small little Mary and I don't work in the quarry and I'm not contributing the same amount as everyone else. Um, so then the girls finish out their season at the academy and the prince comes and there's a whole ball set up and they all get their fancy dresses um, and Mary ends up winning academy princess. So at the end, in their final exam, they're sitting outside and they're going around in a circle like they, and Alana's asking them questions. Um, and sort of throughout this whole story, there's been a side aspect, a little bit of magic going on, and it is quarry speak. And so the people of Mount Eskel are able to communicate to each other through the lender in the mountain. Um, and Miri is very fascinated with that because she's not part of the quarry. That's where it's primarily used, um, of how it works. And she discovers it's all based on memory. And so as they're in this lesson, one girl kind of starts to mess up, like get confused. And Miri is able to send her a memory that reminds her of the answer through Corey speak and all the girls hear it. And so eventually all the girls start helping each other. And so everyone passes completely and they all get to go to the ball. And so it's a beautiful example of, you know, friendship and supporting each other. Um, yes, because they've all worked so hard all year and a few girls were just kind of on the cusp of like not gonna make it and when you have a not great teacher like Alana sometimes you gotta help your friends out um and, but it comes down to the very end and there's this one girl who has been not super nice to Mary the whole time and she's older but she's very dedicated she's like I am the prime candidate I'm going to go be academy princess um and but she starts to mess up and Mary and everybody else is like, no, we're not gonna help you because you've been unkind to us and not willing to help. And Miri decides, you know what, nope, we've helped everyone else as she helps this girl uh, answer this question. And so then they're tied and all the other girls vote for Miri and she gets to be Academy Princess so she gets the fancy dress and they go to the ball um, where they all meet the prince. And he's just a little, he's very formal and stiff and they're all kind of like, well that, was anticlimactic um, and the next morning he just leaves he's like uh I'm gonna go home I'll let you know my decision later and so they're like you've been studying for a whole year we've done all of this stuff and then you were supposed to come up and pick a bride and you didn't um, and so he goes home and then uh, so the girls are kind of like okay and everybody else packs up all the rest of the people that came for this big event leave um and then several bandit a band a group of bandits a band of bandits uh arrives and they take the academy hostage because they believe they're gonna show up and the prince is gonna be there and they're gonna be able to take the ho prince hostage for a large ransom but then they show up it's just the girls and they try and convince them you know just to hand over whoever he chose as the princess and we'll take her and the rest of you can go and the girls the I'm the princess no I'm the princess and everybody is uh, and so then they are like well I guess we have to hold all of you hostage um, and through Cory speak Mary is able to reach back home and their town has a uh, long history like a story about the one time bandits came to Mount Eskel and discovered the only thing of value is this really heavy stone and also there are lots of large strong people here and so they haven't had a problem with bandits until this and she's able to communicate back home this story through uh quarry speak and um is able to call and the villagers show up and rescue the girls um, and they return home for the winter and the next spring the prince comes out and they kind of have a second meeting with him and he ends up choosing Britta to be the princess. Now Britta missed the first meeting. She got sick before the ball. Um, we learned that Britta actually and the prince grew up together and they were good friends. And her parents are not dead, but had sent her to Mount Eskel when they heard that the princess was coming from Mount Eskel and sort of faked and lied to get her in there to get her in that. And so Britta has felt guilty this whole time that I don't want to take one of these girls spots um, when they should be the one but 
they're all kind of like, no, this is the best, you're probably the best choice for this anyway. And the Academy has brought so much to Mount Eskel that we don't need to be princess. Like, we now have this knowledge that we had kind of are able to have some money um, and we are able to, uh, some of the girls take their education and they are able to go out into the rest of Danland and then Danland uh, decides to recognize Mount Eskel as a official province and so one of the girls ends up, is chosen to be the official delegate for that and then they're able to help teach their classmates and share that or not their classmates, their family members, and bring learning to Mount Eskel. And so it all ends up being this very wonderful thing for them, even though none of them ends up being the princess. Uh, well, Britta does, but not one of the girls officially from Mount Eskel. Okay, so let's take a look at the characters found in this book and sort of the way that they represent adolescence. So Miri is our main character. Um, she's depicted on the kind of middle group of the girls. So they are up to like 17, I think, to maybe 13. So she's probably 15-ish. Um, she feels like an outcast within her own society because she doesn't work in the quarry. And throughout the book, she this perception is sort of resolved and she's able to recognize the, the place that she has there as well as her place within her family um, resolved some conflict unspoken conflict with her father where she's like maybe my dad doesn't think I'm good enough to work in the quarry and it's kind of able to understand that all of that is not true um, she's a very hard worker she's curious she wants to help her classmates she does get into trouble sometimes of she's a little mischievous um, and likes to push boundaries uh, her main friend throughout is Britta. So Britta is a lowlander. So she's from, I think, the capital city of Danland. And she grew up, she knew the prince, like her family's well-to-do. Um, and they snuck her into Mount Eskel, sort of, by saying, get on this cart and tell them that our family is dead and that you're related to someone there and they'll take you in. And so that's what's happened. So throughout, she has this sort of hidden secret guilt that she's being, being given this opportunity to become the princess and eventually the queen but she's not earned it um, and like she doesn't deserve it she shouldn't be here and she also is a, has some confused opinions about the girls and other people on Mount Eskel that for the most part are resolved by the beginning of the book that she's lived with them for a while to know that like everything that people say is not true um, but definitely is sort of it goes on and she learns with the other girls and kind of gets to build a friendship and become part of them it's very beneficial for her um mary's two other main friends are isa and frid so they're other mount eskel girls so frid is a big quarry girl like very strong uh, broad shoulders at the end of the book she the girls are kind of discussing what do they want after the prince has said that he's not coming he's like that doesn't make his decision and so they're all talking about well you know do any of us really want to be the princess or now that they have these opportunities that have been opened up by this education that they've received you know what do they want to do with that and so Fred says this education has been wonderful I'm so glad that I have it I you know want to share it with my family but really my passion my love is working in the quarry with my family and so she goes back to that uh isa about the same age uh she had an accident or was born with some deformity and doesn't have use of one of her arms so she also doesn't work in the quarry so she's that's the comparison that's made one of the comparisons when uh miri's talking with i believe it's frid's mother actually and she's like well isa doesn't work in the quarry and no one you know judges Issa for that like she has other important roles and tasks to carry out for her family and you know taking care of their goats and things like that so both of them together are their fun pair that get to support Miri and show her that like oh we just kind of thought you were quiet and shy and didn't want to necessarily be friends with us and that's why you were more reserved we never thought less of you because you didn't work in the quarry um Issa 
has very much loved the education and she and Miri have decide at the end to open a school for all of the other people on Mount Eskel to help share with them uh, basic skills like reading, writing, math, commerce, things like that. <coughs> um, and then our sort of antagonist, an antagonistic, she's not the bad guy, uh, but Katar is the young lady that is puts Miri down throughout. She's old, on the older end of the girls and she's kind of has this attitude of, well, I'm the oldest and I'm the smartest, so I'm going to be the best at this and I'm going to be Academy Princess and I'm going to follow all of the rules and we're not going to get off course. And so when Miri causes problems, sometimes she gets upset and is like, Miri, you're causing trouble for everybody and you should just get it together. And so this is, <laughs> sort of causes some problems and strife and the two of them can kind of divide the group sometimes. Um, but it's disco uh, discovered, uh, Katara says later to Miri, she's like, I don't want to stay on Mount Eskel. I, I really feel like I need to go somewhere bigger than this and like have more people. And so Miri is then able to support her and recommend to Britta like, hey, Katara would be a really great delegate for you know, the official council now that we're going to be a province um, and is able to help lift her up and Miri helps her in the final exam. And so that relationship is happily mended at the end. So throughout shows lots of female friendships, both they're good examples of friendships. There's nobody that's like a bad friend. Um, there's some petty drama and things that go on of like, you got us in trouble and <laughs> or things like that. Um, a lot the girls do work together a lot to you know negotiate better terms with uh Olana and they get, share a lot of family and cultural history that we see in the spring festival portion um so it's a really great example of good adolescent behavior it shows how adolescents can be good at problem solving and you know sometimes have good ideas and answers to problems that are being faced. So looking at our key themes and lessons within the book, I've pulled out uh, three. So the first one is the power of collective narrative. So there's a lot of shared storytelling within Mount Eskel, right? So the story of the bandits is one that comes up quite often and sort of it's a group recitation thing that when they're at the spring uh, festival, uh, they like one person will start it and the next person picks it up and the girls actually do this when the bandits come is they start telling the story as they're sitting around uh, held captives and the bandits are not a fan of that <laughs> that they're doing that um, it also plays into the Corey speak right and then that it is in those shared memories that they have that they're able to communicate through um, so like that basis of shared memory is sort of at the foundation of their society and the foundation of so many things within the book. So looking at some research out there is uh, humans are moral. It's a quote from Anna Maria Luke and Alexander Chidley. Humans are moral believing and narrating animals who thrive in a moral order created by shared stories about who we are what we ought to do and what is sacred. Okay, so shared stories within a family or within a community um, very much impact the way that members of that community see themselves and the ability to sort of participate in that. Um, if we're looking at like biblical examples, right? Like in the Jewish tradition, there was, you know, young Jewish boys, they started out life studying the, uh, the Pentateuch and learning it to, so and so there is that shared narrative of they know these stories of the Bible everybody has that shared knowledge and story together and it's very much shared and so within a family um, it may look like oh yeah these are memories that we have that we made together and it may be things like hey we've all read we have these shared story of our history of the Bible and things like that. Um, one sort of danger of the shared narrative, um, while it is good, 
is it can cause outgroups um, to be even more ostracized, such as like the members of Mount Askell, like they're like, oh yeah, we have this shared unit that we all understand and have, and people that are outside of it, like they're on the outside, they can't come in. And it's very hard for them to sort of join because they don't know all of the short stories and all of the history. Right, and so the book shows sort of uh, Britta being taught those stories and that narrative, and that she's sort of, that's how she's welcomed in, is when they share those things with her and help her learn them. Um, but there is some stories that show, or some studies that show seeing out groups representative in a positive light, such as, um, the way that Britta is sort of welcomed in in novels it can in seeing out groups representative of positive light in fiction can lead to better trust in real life so as adolescents are reading these books books like princess academy and seeing like oh here's this outsider and like she's different from them and she's not a part of their group but she's also still a good person right like the way that we see with Britta and her abilities to join and learn and you know be a part of the community is important um then the reader is able to turn and like apply that to their own lives and see oh well i've got this classmate who maybe is from either a different state or even maybe a different country or just sort of a different family background or life background than me and we don't necessarily have all of the same shared narratives and histories um but they still Maybe we can share some things and like I can teach them about some things and they can teach me about their customs and together we can learn and they're still a good person, right? Like, uh, I moved a couple times when I was younger and so sometimes like I would come into situations where I was like, oh, I don't know, these, I feel like these people have been friends all their lives, so now I'm an outsider. And when they reach out to me and like shared that with me and helped welcome me in, that was such a wholesome, happy feeling, um, right? Where okay, I don't have that shared narrative, so helping me bring it, bring me into it and learn from it was super impactful. Um, so our next lesson is the power of knowledge and the importance of education, right? Like that's sort of what this whole book centers around that these girls are, they learn things, <laughs> right? They go, once they have opportunity and access to education, their whole lives and also the lives of everyone around them is completely changed and they're open to so many more opportunities and their quality of life is so much improved. Um, so right, like Miri, the key example being Miri finding out that this lender is worth so much more, but also then she goes home and she's able, she starts teaching people to read right away and is like, okay, I want you to have access to what I have too. Like her sister, cause her sister is not allowed to go. Um, to the academy she's too old so Mary starts trying to teach her the things that she's learned um and shared that and Mary and Issa decide well we want to establish a school here on Mount Eskel to teach everybody else how to read and write and the things that we've some of the things we've learned in academy like eh, maybe we don't need to teach like the properties of etiquette right like that's not what's important we know the proper the proper way to like behave in our society we have those shared narratives but we can teach how to read and write and mathematics and uh commerce and things like that that are everybody should have access and understanding to um yeah those improved career opportunities that i meant mentioned the but they aren't necessarily forced into it right the Qatar is able to go and become the representative for their province and then um, Peter is able to pursue his artistic side and do carving and but f and then Frid goes back to the quarry and goes back to what she knows and what she loves and it's not shown as like a bad thing right um, also the girls use their new education to stand up against Olana in the middle when they come back and they say all right we will not be con continue to be treated in this way like you can't keep putting us in closets that are full of rats and just leaving us there like that's bad and not okay and they're able to negotiate better terms for themselves of okay if we we will agree to respect your rules and 
you know, you don't need to continue having soldiers here to threaten us with, um, and it improves then that relationship between these two cultures, uh, their educate, once they have the education and the knowledge to say, you can't act like you're better than me because we are the same. Like I have been denied access to education and that's why I know less. Not because I am less capable, not because I am, you know, less than, like I will be treated as an equal because I am an equal. Um, and then once they're able to join the country as an official province and even broader, like stand up for their people and be representative in, represented in government and be seen and heard and sort of challenge these perceptions nationwide of, okay, we know that you have been told your whole lives, you have this narrative that we are not as smart, not as capable, not like we're just the hillbillies in the mountains, but we're not, right? Like we are strong and we are independent and like we have important things to offer to these to you and we want the things that you have to offer to us and so let's engage in that relationship in a strong meaningful way so there's a quote at the end that addresses a little bit of the controversy of when Britta is chosen even though she's not necessarily from Mount Eskel which is something that comes up very heavily in the second book uh, which I would also recommend it's not quite as lovely and wonderful as this one but it is still really really good um so the quote is Maybe the priests knew what they were doing. Maybe Mount Eskel didn't need a princess, just an academy. So the priests, religion doesn't play a huge role in this book. It's just sort of mentioned a couple times. There's like priests and they, um, there is like, they have a chapel in town uh, that's carved with the stories of like their religious stories and things like that. Um, but it's sort of, it's not a major point, but the priests are the ones who say, ah yes, the girls will come from, the girl will come from Mount Eskel, but really what Mount Eskel is need, they needed was the academy to come and to teach these girls and to be able to spread that and sort of fate and providence are the ones that sort of led that access to education, right? Um, so yeah, if we look at our history in America, education is very important and access to education is something that is celebrated everywhere. Um, right, Brown versus Board of Education, right, that in these days it is doubtful any child may be reasonably expected to succeed in life is if he is denied the opportunity of an education. Right, it's this pivotal court case that we found our beliefs on that everyone should have access to education and we know how important it is. So I think and I feel like that is something that's understood and seen. I think that there is some space to preach the value of education to children, right? Um, I think it's pretty common to run into teens where it's like, oh, it's hard. I'm done being educated, all right? Like I've learned enough that I think books like this one help show like, yeah, it is multiplication tables and maybe that doesn't feel as valuable but the education as a whole is very important to being able to increase prosperity for yourself and for those around you and you know without it a lot is lost um but also quality of education is really important where they did send olana who was kind of one of the best teachers um in the country because they're like we need these girls to be really well educated so statistically 10 percent of students in private schools make up 30 percent of college students um as of 2016 so it's a little bit of an older statistic but it just goes to show it, private school education uh because of you know funding and things like that like it tends to be a little bit higher quality um it's a little more intentional and the things that it's teaching right because parents are choosing to put their students into that um workplace and so i think that it's important to make sure that the quality of the education is in, is good everywhere um i think there's space for that definitely in america <laughs> but also at home we can be helping show the value of education to students of 
well, here, what are the things that you're learning that you're able to apply to your life? And, you know, how is this going to help you? And helping them see those values is very, can help a lot, kind of combat some of the, oh, I have to go to school, I don't, I don't cool, school's not cool, I don't want to, you know, that attitude that we see sometimes, um, which is a part of adolescence, right? It's wanting to, adolescence is sort of learning to be an independent person and discovering what you want and the way that you want to lead your life, um, which is, has a little bit of natural rebellion against parents of, well, I want to do this, I want to figure out what it means for me to live my life. And so when school is seen as this thing that you have to do, you know, I think there's a tendency towards teens to like separate that from their identity of like, well, I want to build my own identity. I don't want to do what people told me I have to do. Um, so it's important to see in books like this that like, oh, like here's the way that this is going to benefit me and this is something that I want and that is good for me. So another key point is self-image in this book, um, which is something that comes up a lot in YA and this sort of princess book especially, right? Um, because as adolescents, self-image is a big deal because they are developing that sense of self and that sense of who am I truly, kind of for the first time is hitting that. So Miri struggles kind of having, developing her own view of herself, but also the way that other people view her is very important to her. Um, she does say that she knows her father loves her at one point. She's like, he hugs me like, you know, he loves me more than the whole world. And so she knows that he loves her, however, she also doesn't understand why he won't let her in the quarry. Um, so she's like, does my father think I'm not capable enough? Does he think that I'm not strong enough? Um, she thinks, she worries that the whole village sees her as weak and as useless. And then once she learns that this isn't true and the truth behind her father's motivation, um, it changes her self-image. Um, she also assumes that the girls are all mad at her when she loses the privilege of going home uh, before the winter, um, only to then later learn, like some of them just thought that she was mad at them and sort of it was a miscommunication thing. And so, but during that time, she's like, she feels really bad about it. And she's like, oh no, like I'm such a bad person. Like I is conflicted because the thing she was doing, she was like, I was helping somebody, that should be a good thing, but then we got in trouble and now everybody's mad at me and struggling with that image, self-image type thing. Um, towards the end, or it's about right after Mary learns the truth about her mother's death, um, Berta tells a story about a little bird whose pen, wings are pinned down, but then once it f uh, is freed, it flies so high it becomes a star. So it feels very much kind of folklore the same way that the story with the bandits is and a lot of the stories that are being passed around in Mount Eskel that this is then a representation of the lowlander um, folklore. So uh, Miri sort of represents that image of well once she's freed from her own constrictions and her worries about what other people see her as she's able to fly very high and free and um, very exciting moment for her. So, so uh, the Encyclopedia on Early Childhood Development says that negative thinking of the parents can sometimes distract them from parenting, can also negatively impact children because they sense and like can understand that negative essence or like negative feeling in the air but don't necessarily understand why and it often gets misinterpreted um again the way that we see with miri that like she knows something's going on with her father and her family but she doesn't understand what it is and so that that negatively impacts her own beliefs um in adolescence uh there's a lot of focus on peers opinions and 
you know, what is other people my age think of me and that developing of identity, wanting to be separate from the parents. But it's founded on earlier beliefs about their, themselves that they're exploring. And that comes from interactions with parents and sort of that foundation of how they've been raised and what the family has been like. So know that as parents and teachers <laughs> working with young people, even as they're trying to maybe push away and lean more into their peers, it is founded on the things that you've built them in beforehand, um, and that they are sort of exploring themselves and figuring it out the way that Mary does in this book. So I've got a couple discussion questions here, but one really great thing about this book is there is discussion questions in the back of most editions. Um, so I, these are just sort of things that I recommend that you can kind of talk about with your kids that get them thinking about sort of those key themes of um, the power of education, the importance of having shared narratives and sort of self-image based in like family tradition and history. So you could talk about, uh, is there any characters that your child or students particularly relate with, right? Because we do have a very diverse cast of characters there um, that would be interesting to explore. You know, kind of where do you feel like you stand? <coughs> Throughout, Mary shares her favorite memories of her family and village. Uh, what are your favorite memories that you've made together? So as parents or teachers, like you can share those things, but also encourage your children, like what are the things that they remember and like really enjoy? And like, what are those stories you can share together? Um, ask your students, how can you support and include others in the ways that Mary, like Mary does, right? That when she, we shouldn't encourage cheating, but right when they cheat on their final exam to help make sure that every girl passes, they use the Corey speech or when she encourages them to kind of, let's go back to finish this out, and, you know, things like that throughout. Um, do you see times in your life at school or somewhere else where certain people are treated unfairly? Like, what can you do to help them? Right? Um, we see Olana treats the girls very unfairly early on and then throughout the novel. And they fight back against that in ways. And they learn that the right way to do that, right, is through the things they've learned about diplomacy as opposed to just sort of breaking the rules. Uh, Mary's father doesn't want her to work in the quarry like other students or like other children. Are there things our family does differently than others that you notice? So I, kids are very perceptive. They know things that are different and sometimes they don't know how to talk about it. I think this is, could be an interesting question just to like sit as a family and be like, yeah, this is something we do differently and to make sure that they understand that the things that are different about them are there's a reason for it and like that you know it's based in the love of their family and you care for them um and miri does the trading for her family so what responsibilities do you have for our families or which ones that you think you might want to take on so these are just sort of suggestions uh whatever works for you <laughs> um just ways to get talking about things that your kids are reading to help encourage that further learning and, you know, make this more than just a fun book to read. So I do have a couple of recommendations of further books, other books that are maybe a little bit more challenging that fall a little bit more towards those classics that um, you wanna see kids reading uh, just for personal gain. It is good for them. So books like Jane Eyre, um, has some of those same themes of the importance of education and the doors that that opens. Uh, so does Malala and Little Women all kind of focus around those ideas of Malala being obviously a real example as opposed to fictional like the other two, um, though Little Women does sort of eh, edge the boundary, right? Because it is almost autobiographical, but not quite. Um, but all three of those books have a lot of focus on importance of education of women and sort of the opportunities and being able to pursue things that are not necessarily traditional. 
Um, and then also The Little Princess, which is a nice book uh, that has some of, sort of the same feel a little bit as uh, Princess Academy in that. I don't know, it's a nice atmosphere. <laughs> um, yes. So thank you so much for watching and learning about Princess Academy with me. I hope that this helps spur either a great book, book recommendation for your child or some new conversation as you're like, and they're reading this book, what's this about? I hope that you are able to go and talk to them and learn together about these things. Thank you so much.